We all love a good story, that's why we're all here. And when that story is personal, or where there's an idea in that story that resonates with us, it has the potential to change us. I guess that's what we're all hoping for today. That's something I try to exploit in my work on a one-to-one -one level, and something that, as speakers, we're trying to exploit on a wider level today here. I'm very privileged in the work that I do. I'm a clinical psychologist. Actually, I always find that difficult to say when I'm anxious, so I'm glad I got that out. <laughs> I get to take part in and witness and support people in hearing their life stories and then seeing them make great changes. And I use the word privilege on purpose because often that experience is very enriching for my own life. I've spent most of my career working with long-term conditions, conditions such as head injury, epilepsy, headaches, Parkinson's disease, chronic pain, neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular muscle wasting diseases, you know, general profound disability. And that list is, isn't the entire list. And I'm not sure if you know, but the medical definition of a long-term condition is a condition that lasts a year or beyond and generally is incurable. And in the UK, there are about 30% of us that have a long-term condition. And often people have more than one. And those 30% use up about, or they utilize about 70% of the entire healthcare budget, which is a big spend on a third of the population. And this is really a, um, a signifier of how successful medicine has been. Your medicine is very good at keeping us alive now, seeing us through to the end of medical problems. And we can all expect to live a lot longer and our family members to live a lot longer. But the general potential cost of that is that you or a family member may be left with a long-term condition that brings with it some difficulties. So I'd like to get you to participate with me in an imagination exercise. It's not going to produce a lot of laughs <laughs> because I want you to imagine that you have a long-term condition. For some of you, this will be quite easy because you may have a long-term condition or someone in your family may. But for others, um, and a point I'm making through this, it actually might be very difficult. I'm going to try and talk you through it. So you have a long-term condition that you've had for five years, and this condition has brought with it chronic pain, and that pain has affected everything that you do in your life. So your job has changed, or maybe you've lost your job, so your professional identity has been challenged, and your, your kind of idea about who you are and value about yourself has been threatened. You feel somewhat ashamed of that, you are very anxious about what the future might bring. Are you going to get worse because this seems to be incurable? And what will happen in your life if you get worse? And lots of things have, have been lost from your life. You can't engage in your hobbies anymore. You've lost friends. Essentially, it's pretty bleak. I'll just give you a second to kind of put that in mind, because for some of you, that could be very, a very big shift from where you're at now. You have this one strand of hope which is that your clinical team that you see once a year, they are going to carry out an assessment or give you a new intervention that solves all of these problems for you. However, when you go to see that clinical team, they give you a very different outlook. They basically say, we've run out of options. There's no further assessments, no further interventions. We're going to move you to a one-year follow-up just to make sure, just to track that you don't get any worse. But actually, we're going to send you to a mind doctor, a psychologist, because big surprise, you don't seem to be getting on very well, you seem anxious, you seem depressed, or actually you aren't adapting your life around these new challenges. How might you arrive, do you think, at that appointment with someone like myself? Do you think you might be angry, confused, a bit, a, a bit uncertain as to how having a physical problem leads you to see somebody who specializes in the mind? Angry? That's actually how a lot of uh, people arrive when they meet me. And what you might have accurately guessed is that in that appointment with me, I'm going to ask a lot of personal questions, quite penetrating questions for about an hour. That, that often gets people quite anxious. And what you might not have guessed, but you might have some idea, is that I'm going to pitch a whole different idea about how you could cope. So currently, I would argue that um, our universal Western idea of health has three steps in it. Get ill, do something, get better. And what I mean by do something is we have a general concept in our, uh, in our minds that if we do something, we recover. 
So maybe we undertake some light exercise, we have a rest, we eat a bit better, that doesn't work, so we see the doctor, the doctor prescribes the medication, that doesn't work, we go back, ask for another, ask for another, then we're referred to a hospital, we see a surgeon, the list goes on with the hopeful outcome that we get better at the end. In fact, it's not just a hopeful outcome, we are truly expecting it. What we don't have is a shared understanding of the fourth step in the model, get ill, do something, don't get better. And what I tend to see is people looping back repeatedly to the do something step. Go back to the doctor, go back to the consultants, be a bit more pushy, be, ask for another consultant, ask for a second opinion. Whatever happens, do not let that health system let you go. The unexpected outcome of not getting better is so unexpected that I see it as damaging in itself. People get frustrated at the health system, they get frustrated at themselves, they start thinking that everyone around them doesn't believe them, maybe their condition um, just doesn't make sense, they aren't talking about it right, the, the right tests aren't being done, the, the doctor's not skilled enough. They get stuck between these two arrows. This fourth step, how do you live with a long-term condition, I would argue is a very shy story in our society against a more boastful story of getting better. You know, we just expect to get better all the time. And we have this idea when it comes to health that we never give up, never accept defeat. You know, we celebrate courageous battling on. This fourth step, how do you live with a long-term condition? How do you adapt and cope? Is what I have to pitch to people in that first hour that I meet them. And at the very least, it has to, for people, make sense. And my hope is that the best, it feels like some sort of epiphany. So I want to take you through what it's like to have that first session with me. Um, so when people arrive, I immediately will explore with them the journey they've had through their health experience up until this point of being referred to me. Often that's full of frustration, people are quite upset, there's lots of dashed hope. And validating that is very important to people. What I then do is I start to talk about what is the difference between suffering with a long-term condition and living with one, and have they actually considered that there is a difference, because there is. What is the difference between acceptance and giving up? Those two words, actually, weirdly, in the West, they seem to be synonymous. People sort of think acceptance is giving up. And also, I then get people to think about how easy it is for us to instinctively be compassionate to other people when they are upset. But how when it's us that are struggling, we seem to be angry and frustrated and we don't activate self-compassion. I then also introduced the idea that there are some strategies and tools that I might be able to coach and teach them with over, over the coming weeks or sessions that might help them. I've seen people make great transformations in the clinic room. I've seen people come with 10 years of being stuck in a really difficult position and just achieving unexpected outcomes. I've seen what amounts to people climbing Everest in front of me. Now, don't get me wrong, not everybody fares well, and some people don't respond to that. And when that's the case, it is a genuine shared loss. Now, you can see that this circle isn't complete. That wasn't because uh, poor design. Um, there is a common theme for some patients and that theme is that for some people, there is a tangible risk that they can get worse. If you've got, an, and, and certainly with a lot of the patients I meet, that's, that, there's a real risk of that. You might have Parkinson's disease, you may have epilepsy, you may have all these conditions where there's a threat, there's a risk to you that you might get worse in the future. And for those patients, it's very difficult to, to quell anxiety and to, you know, to just go, okay, I'm accepting this, I'm gonna cope with it. And so they, they, they seek some form of reassurance, and that, that really comes in the form, usually, of continued contact with the health service. They don't want to be just discharged. They don't want to be forgotten in case there's a free fall in their health and there's no safety net. This is very difficult for the health service to meet. You know, the number of people with these long-term health conditions we can expect to increase as medicine continues to do a good job and society gets older, and it creates what's potentially an impossible challenge in the West, in the current health service, which is how do we provide more um, safety nets to more people without more resource? So there's an emerging solution, um, and it's called eHealth. And this is being proposed as a, as a potential opportunity to sort this out. And eHealth is the idea that technology can be used to support people 
to support themselves in their own home. Now, when, when I say e-health to people, they're often quite cynical. They either say, oh, well, you know, I can't really see how an app can do very much for a piece of technology. I prefer to see my clinician. Um, or they just don't really understand what e-health is. The whole idea just seems a bit vague. That's not totally surprising. You know, currently, there's something like 165,000 plus apps available for health. And the idea of what is e-health is a little bit ill-defined. And if I was to say to you now, pick a condition, say epilepsy, and then find an app that helps you, and you maybe go on your phone and type in epilepsy, there would be hundreds of options. And the question is, how would you make a decision about which one's useful to you? And, and actually, is it you that should be making that decision? I work in a number of health teams which believe that's not how we deliver e-health. We believe that e-health should emerge out of clinical need, out of clinical settings, and should be designed to meet a need that dovetails into e-health. Or we actively select something that exists that, that fits. In those teams, I work as a software designer. So I specialize in designing the experience that people have of the software. And um, I also help to design the health service that the software connects to. And that's very important because when we do that with clinicians and patients, you essentially get a tool which hopefully fits what people want and need and connects to their health service, like becomes an extension of that health service. So I've been quite vague about eHealth. I want to give you an example. It's, a, it's an application that we have created to try and uh, support a particular patient group. <laughs> and it's called EPSMON. And this is the epilepsy self-monitor. So this uh, tool emerged out of um, what is now nearly six years of research in Cornwall, which led to a significant reduction in the number of deaths, sudden unexpected deaths in epilepsy. Now, I'm saying deaths on purpose. Not a lot of people realize that you can die from epilepsy, but epilepsy is in fact one of the top 10 causes of death for those under the age of 70. And about 42% of those people who die are hypothesized their deaths could be avoided if they were managed better. So this is quite a few people who are dying in, some, you know, in, in the UK and internationally. So what we did is we undertook some research to identify what were the factors that would predict possibly whether somebody might be at risk of dying. And this hadn't really been done systematically. And we then took those factors and created a checklist which was, was a kind of questionnaire. We then took that checklist and we applied it to the histories of all of the people in Cornwall who had died from epilepsy across a seven-year period. And when we did that, we found that 90% of those who had died, three to six months before they died, something changed that we would have been able to detect on this checklist. And that 80% of those people who had died had not had a clinical appointment with an epilepsy specialist one year prior to their death. So this was both alarming and also reassuring in, in, in regards to this tool. So this tool, we then wanted to uh, pilot. It was piloted in Cornwall, and it was piloted for a few years, and what we saw was this reduction in deaths. So we then wanted to make a tool that would, would have national or international impact, which is why we created EPSMON. So EPSMON is a very simple app. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a number of questionnaires. You put in your medications, you put in the conditions that you've got, and then every three months, based on the evidence that being the, the risk zone for people, it prompts you to complete what looks like a very simple questionnaire. And the user might be misled to think this is actually too simple because you're just saying yes, no, yes, no. But what that app's actually doing is it's feeding all of the most cutting-edge research that has a panel of experts behind it to your phone, which updates as we update that tool. So every year we repeat that search of what are the risk factors, and we update the tool. If risk is identified, then the app will give you very, very targeted education around why that's important, why it needs addressed, and it will signal that you need clinical care, and you can take this device with you to your clinician, and it will tell your clinician exactly why you've come and what, what needs to be addressed. EPSMON, um, it's now freely available in the UK, and it's about to be released in the States after winning a big prize over there. And it's, been, it's done extremely well, actually, in terms of prestigious prizes. What it's not doing so well is getting people with epilepsy to use it. And this is no big surprise, really, because, as I said, people don't really get e-health. I think the idea that an iPhone app or an Android app could save your life is something that probably people don't understand yet. And until clinicians are reaching for apps when they're writing prescriptions, 
we won't have the full culture shift won't be made. And this is a shift we're trying to support. My aspirations beyond Epsmon and in the wider sector of um, e-health is that I'd like to see e-health empower people about their health and not in a tokenistic way. So I'd like to see that when people get education, that education responds to your needs. This app knows when you need to learn something and that's when it tells you. I want to see apps that, uh, not just apps, but technology that assesses you in many ways. So it might be questionnaires, it might be wearable sensors. There's a whole host of things in the future that are arriving, but it does it in a sensible, clever, and meaningful way that to you, the experience feels like an extension of your healthcare. And that information is fed back to your clinical team in a way that when your condition changes and when you need them, they chase you rather than you worrying that you've got to chase them. And I'd also like to see technology that works differently in families. So I'd like to see technology where sometimes it is appropriate that you are the one entering this for your mother, or maybe you as a, as a husband and a wife should both be entering information about one of you because actually the clinician would expect that in the clinical room. So this, thinking about e-health in this light, I think, is very exciting. I see it as a potential health revolution in that in supporting people with long-term conditions, we've got this, this final step, something that will help people to reduce their anxiety about the future, to feel that there's a digital safety net that's there to catch them if they fall. And I'm hoping that if we can lever this technology into people's lives, that there'll be a general relaxing of their uncertainty about the future, and they'll feel a bit more confident that they can move away from the healthcare system, freeing up some of the existing resource and, and passing some of that onto technology that works really well. And I hope, and my personal driver for this, is if we're able to achieve that, if we're able to achieve a reduction in the anxiety that people have, a feeling that we have a digital safety net around us, that for many of us who have these problems, we can re-engage with our lives, and in the future, feeling mortal will be the furthest thing from our minds. Thank you.